Well, I'd like to start off by saying a quick word of thanks to the sponsors and organizers of this talk. It's really a great pleasure to be able to spend some time with you today and to discuss some important ethical issues uh, that have arisen around this pandemic in recent times of COVID-19. So the topic, the title of my talk is Vaccines, Ventilators, and the Ethics of COVID-19. Before we get started, a quick mention of where you can find additional resources related to these topics. If you go to the website of the National Catholic Bioethics Center, ncbcenter.org, or to my website, fathertad.com, you can find a number of additional resources that are likely to be of interest. So in terms of introducing this virus, uh, the virus name is SARS-CoV-2. That's how most scientists know it, although it has some alternative designations shown here as 2019 N-CoV and H-CoV-19. If we ask for the classification of this virus, it definitely would be a coronavirus. And if we inquire about the disease that is caused by the virus, it would be, of course, COVID-19, that constellation of different symptoms that arise once you are infected by the virus. Everybody's concerned about how dangerous this is, and so we want to look at the question of the case fatality rate for the virus and make some comparisons here that'll help us get a sense of perspective. So seasonal influenza has a case fatality rate that ranges between 0.1 and 0.2 percent. If you look at the Spanish influenza epidemic of 1918, it was more than 2.5 percent the case fatality rate. And the interesting thing about that particular uh, outbreak was that it affected mostly younger people rather than the elderly, which is uh, kind of the opposite of what we have been seeing with the COVID-19 situation. So COVID-19 has a case fatality rate that appears to range between 0.7 and 3.4 percent. There were some reports that in Wuhan, China, during the peak of the outbreak, that the case fatality rate uh, was just under 5 percent. But there are some important additional factors to roll into the consideration of these statistics. For example, the CDC update for the week ending August 15th showed that only 6% or about 9,000 deaths of all the 153,000 deaths recorded in the U.S., uh, only 6% died from COVID-19. The other 94% had two to three other serious illnesses. The majority of those who died were of a very advanced age, with something like 90% of those people in nursing homes. So it reminds us how statistics are complex. They're subject to fluctuation during the unfolding of a pandemic. The numbers are going to be moving. Things like testing rates will be of relevance. And the more that people are tested, the more these numbers uh, will, will self-adjust to uh, a more accurate and descriptive level. In terms of survival, sometimes also phrased in terms of the infection fatality ratio, again, some statistics from the CDC from September 10th of 2020 indicated these survival rates for those who were infected. If you were between the ages of 0 and 19, about a 99.997% survival rate. Pretty good. If you were between the ages of 20 and 49, about 99.98% survival. If you were between the ages of 50 and 69 and you contracted this virus, you had a 99.5% survival rate. But if you were older than 70, a notable drop here, the survival rate was about 94.6%. So these kinds of details are important 
and it calls to mind this famous aphorism from Mark Twain, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. When we discuss coronaviruses, there are two major types. There are the normal coronaviruses and then the novel ones. So what do we mean by this? Well, normal coronaviruses tend to affect the upper part of your lungs. They cause upper respiratory infections. So examples of this would include coronaviruses that cause about 5 to 10 percent of common cold or upper respiratory infections, and these ones would be known as alpha and beta coronaviruses. It's important to realize, though, that you can get upper respiratory infections from other sources, of course, and we've just been so focused on COVID-19 in recent times that this detail sometimes gets obscured or lost in the fray. So some of these other upper respiratory infections would include the rhinovirus, which does cause a lot of colds and cold symptoms. Then others like influenza A and B, adenovirus, parainfluenza, and there's actually quite a few others as well. The novel coronaviruses, in contrast to the normal coronaviruses, affect the lower part of your lung. So they cause lower respiratory infections, and some examples of these would include SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, which was contained back in 2003. This has a case fatality rate that is rather high, about 10%. If you're more elderly, older than 60 years of age, the case fatality rate is more than 50%. So those are very striking numbers. And one can understand in the face of those numbers why there was a quickly activated a response once SARS was originally discovered uh, in those early years of the 2000s. Another example of the novel coronaviruses would be MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. This disease has not been contained, and it has a case fatality rate that is very high, 35%, and getting this disease is linked to direct camel exposure very often. And then our particular novel coronavirus, again SARS-CoV-2. And again another reminder, there are other causes of lower respiratory infections. These would include, for example, viral pneumonia, influenzas, adenovirus, parainfluenza, etc. She's reading the novel here, the novel Coronavirus, and she says, I don't think I want to know the ending of this one. Now, a lot of people are wondering, how did this burst on the scene in this way? Where did it come from? What is the origin of this virus? So the short answer would be zoonotic transmission through an intermediary. What does that mean in plain language? It means that this virus arose or was uh, present in certain animals and then may have been transmitted through other animals to humans. So, specifically, bats are very good reservoirs for a number of viruses. And they have this amazing feature that bats can be infected with a number of viruses, but they themselves will not get sick. And so scientists are studying this phenomenon to understand how it is that bats manifest this immunity to particular viruses. So in the case of the original SARS uh, virus, this was in a bat, and then it was believed to have been transmitted to a particular animal, one that many people have never heard of. I know I had not heard of it prior to doing some research in this area. An animal called the masked palm civet. And then from that animal, it appears to have been transmitted to human beings. For the MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, that also was in bats and appears to have been transmitted to camels, in particular to dromedary camels, and then from them to us. Now what about SARS-CoV-2? What is the intermediary animal? Because it also has been demonstrated to be present in the bats 
And some research, some initial research, suggests that the animal in this case is not a penguin, but a pangolin. Here's a picture of one uh, with one of the young attached to the back. And here's another picture of these animals in one of the markets in Wuhan. These are a scaly anteater. And they do uh, have a history of being connected to the exotic animal market in Wuhan and other parts of China. So there's a theory that there was this Wuhan level 4 biohazard lab and they may have been using these animals, studying them, and then perhaps some of the animals were sold afterwards for human consumption. And that would obviously be a problem. They are used in Chinese medicine as well. So somehow there was this jump from these animals to humans. You may have heard some theories out there that SARS-CoV-2 was actually produced in this level 4 biohazard lab in Wuhan intentionally by scientists. It seems that that claim has not been well substantiated. It seems highly doubtful. Viruses like this are quite complex and not easy to just kind of piece together a new virus uh, out of you know, other pieces of DNA from other viral elements. So it seems that that claim uh, has not withstood scrutiny or been demonstrated uh, in any kind of compelling way. So this sums up the origin and transmission of uh, our coronavirus under consideration, starting in bats, transmission to pangolins, and then to humans. How contagious is this? How easily is it transmitted? What level of infectiveness are we talking about here? And I want to introduce a statistical concept that's helpful here, a kind of rough measure for contagiousness. It's called r naught or R0. And what this is, it's the number of cases directly generated by one case in a completely susceptible population without interventions. So if you're not doing anything and people are just you know, mingling and so on at their normal levels, this will be an indication of how many other people will be infected by one individual who has the disease. So, for example, here, we're looking at a case of R0 or R0 equal to 3. One infected person will typically be seen to infect, on average, three others. So we want to look at this R0 value for a range of other diseases that are out there, because it gives a kind of sense of perspective to place this in context. And this diagram is very helpful. You'll notice in the middle of each of these circles, there is a kind of larger red head. That is the original infected individual. And then you notice various others in orbit around it. So if you look at the bottom right at measles, measles is extremely infective. And you notice that the r naught value, the R0 value, equals 16. So this really gets transmitted rapidly, highly infective. If you look to the left of that, you see smallpox. The R0 is 6. Rubella is 6. Mumps, it goes down a little to 4.5. The original SARS, 3.5. And COVID-19 appears to be 2.5, maybe 3 for the R0 value. A little further, going backwards, you'll notice Ebola, that has an R0 of 2, influenza, 1.5, and the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, 0 0.8. So these numbers give us a sense that COVID-19 is definitely infectious, but it's not the most infectious agent that is out there. This R0 value serves as a kind of indicator to the threshold of an epidemic. That means that if your r naught value is bigger than 1, you are dealing with a potential epidemic situation, while if your r naught value is less than 1, you'll be looking at extinction, loss of this virus. Meanwhile, if it's hovering around a value of 1, then we would say that the virus is endemic, which means it has a certain stability 
uh, it will remain present uh, and continue to be propagated, but not likely to generate full-scale epidemics or pandemics. So what about these terms, these epidemiological terms? Just a reminder, an outbreak would refer to more disease than might be expected. So for example, the measles outbreaks, we speak of those happening occasionally. If something is endemic, as we alluded to earlier, that means that the disease remains in an area naturally. If we have an epidemic, then that's a regional outbreak of a disease that spreads rather suddenly and unexpectedly. And, of course, the term pandemic refers to the worldwide and often rapid spread of a disease. And when this happens, the World Health Organization will make a declaration, and that will have implications for activating a worldwide response to the outbreak. Here he's talking and kind of reminiscing, saying, Grandpa, tell us again the story of what life was like before COVID-19. You see up on the wall of the cave pictures of cars and airplanes and uh, other reminders of the way things once were. Certainly, uh, this cartoon captures the fact that our lives have been profoundly affected by the arrival of this coronavirus. So I want to look at a diagram dealing with infectivity just to kind of visualize this a little bit better. In the middle, you have a red circle and that's one infected person. And we're going to assume that there's an r naught value here of 2.5 or 3, just like for the coronavirus, for COVID-19. What happens? Well, three other people become infected, as shown here. And each of those three can subsequently infect three others. And each of those can then go on and infect another three. So you see this gets to be a, a big well-branching tree with a lot of infections that are spreading rather rapidly. Now we want to look at this diagram another way. What happens if we isolate an individual who is infectious, as shown by the yellow arrow and the blue dot? Well, you notice that stops the transmission. So when that happens, you notice the whole lower branch of this tree has not seen subsequent infections. And what this means is that instead of 30 people being infected, we have only 23. So this is the value of isolating individuals to limit the spread of disease. And it shows um, the merits to taking steps uh, towards containment. So what this also reminds us is that when we're talking about r not, again, that was when there's no interventions, but when you start using interventions, the value of r naught becomes smaller. The infectivity goes down. So the interventions that we're thinking of would include immunizations, might include immunity from people who got infected but then recovered, would include things like social distancing, the use of masks to prevent transmission, quarantines, isolation, and perhaps the development of other treatments as well. These types of interventions are what we refer to when we discuss flattening the COVID-19 curve. So you notice on the left here that we have this tall red bump, which represents the r naught value itself, meaning no protective measures in place. And the concern, as you see, it goes above the dotted line, which is the healthcare system capacity that hospitals might be overwhelmed by the number of patients who are rapidly getting infected. And then you run out of supplies, etc. Meanwhile, with protective measures, you have this flattening of the curve, as shown in the blue. You have a methodology, a tactic, to protect the healthcare system from being overwhelmed. Because clearly none of us want to see situations where People are being basically um, warehoused out in the hallways of hospitals, not being able to be attended to. All right, she asks, aren't you going to do something to fight the coronavirus to Superman? And he says, I'm doing it. Stay home. 
Quarantine versus isolation, just to clarify a little bit here, quarantine would be separating and restricting the movement of well persons who may have been exposed to others, and you monitor and see if they do become ill, while isolation would be separating ill people who have a communicable disease and restricting their movement so they can't pass it on further. So, maybe things haven't really changed much. That's captured in this uh, little cartoon. You have the people before the times of quarantine. They're out and about in the great outdoors in their city, and they're all checking their text messages and emails. And after quarantine, on the other hand, well, they're still checking their text messages and emails, just in a slightly different locale. How does this disease progress? In the first week, there tends to be fever, fatigue, malaise, oftentimes a dry cough, and some shortness of breath. In the second week, about 15 to 20 percent of those infected will have severe shortness of breath. Uh, this is due to the beginnings of viral pneumonia. They may need to be hospitalized. They may require some supportive care, maybe an oxygen mask maybe a nasal cannula to get them some oxygen, etc. In week three, of those who are hospitalized, maybe 30% will need ICU care, with up to half of those needing intubation. So this means about 5% of the total diagnosed cases will need uh, ICU and ventilatory support going on to a ventilator. Now, how do you die from this? It goes something like this. There will be a rapid decline, maybe over a period of a day or two, from a mild low oxygen status to what's called ARDS, or Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, uh, where you have extreme difficulty breathing. This will also in include oftentimes a cytokine storm where your immune system is going completely out of whack. You'll have multi-organ failure taking place, and then cardiac shock the stoppage of your heart and death. So ventilators. I want us to have a moment here to discuss ventilators and the question of their availability. And I have a little video here that introduces the topic, I think, rather nicely and succinctly. Most people who get sick with COVID-19 won't need hospital treatment. But for the around 6% of people who do, especially those who are older or who have health complications, a ventilator can save their life. A ventilator is a machine that helps patients breathe. When patients are put on a ventilator, they're intubated. The other end of the tube is attached to the ventilator, which blows air and oxygen into the patient's lungs. A ventilator can provide pressure that helps hold open the lungs so their tiny air sacs inside don't collapse. And it makes it easier to clear the windpipe if the patient is too weak to cough. Severe cases of COVID-19 include respiratory failure, where a patient's lungs have been damaged to the point that their body is not getting enough oxygen. At that point, the patient needs to be put on a ventilator as soon as possible. The most severe cases mean they could need a ventilator for weeks. According to recent analysis, U.S. hospitals have 62,000 full-feature ventilators with nearly 100,000 ventilators with lesser capabilities. But more than 900,000 patients may need ventilators during the coronavirus pandemic, depending on how bad it gets. If there aren't enough ventilators to go around, then healthcare workers will be forced to make extremely difficult decisions about who receives care. So I think this video is helpful uh, on a number of levels, but you'll notice at the end also, this video was made early in the pandemic. There were some predictions regarding the shortages of ventilators that were likely to accrue. And that's what we wanted to focus on here in particular, was what about if there really are shortages? So the kinds of questions we're going to be looking at, what if a public health emergency creates demand for critical care resources like ventilators that outstrips the supply? How is that going to be handled? How do you fairly make these ventilators available? Should triage committees be able to take away a patient's ventilator without his or her consent if someone else needs it more and would benefit more from receiving it. So an important principle here that I think we want to start out with is the principle of subsidiarity, 
which reminds us that we shouldn't withdraw those decisions that rightly belong to individuals or smaller groups and assign them to higher authorities or larger groups, as can happen, for example, when medical decisions may be shifted away from doctors and their patients and handed over to insurance companies or hospital administrators. There's a sense in which it's important to stay at the appropriate local level to resolve these questions that affect people at the local level. So the implications here would be that frontline clinicians, together with their patients, should be making these decisions about ventilators with ethics committees or triage committees serving only in an advisory capacity, not you know, adjudicating or themselves uh, from on high, as it were, making the decisions on behalf of the patient and the doctor. Important to mention here that sometimes there are good alternatives to rationing, and those really need to be very carefully examined. Uh, they often are viable alternatives. One would be ramping up ventilator manufacturing, and we've certainly seen that happen during the coronavirus, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. The possibility of repurposing other medical devices to serve as ventilators. Also, you can transfer patients out of urban settings to smaller hospitals that might not be experiencing shortages of ventilators. This would be the kind of thing where maybe you'd have, um, you know, helicopters that were specifically set up to transfer some of these critical patients, airlift them out of the urban setting to uh, a more rural setup. There's also been talk about the possibility of double tubing patients on one machine. This is uh, potentially quite complex to do, may be possible, but the machine uh, apparently will not function as well as it should when you attempt to do this. So again, this would be a very, very extreme type of measure. Worth noting that so far during the U.S. COVID-19 pandemic, no rationing protocols have had to be placed into effect. They have not been necessary. That's a very fortunate situation that we have had adequate resources to be able to manage the surge that has occurred in different settings. When we talk about the ethics of allocating ventilators, a couple of general points. We should not ration ventilators based on age or disability, like being paraplegic, or on other secondary traits. Because that's kind of the temptation, I think, sometimes, to engage in a form of discrimination against some people based on factors that actually are not critical factors. The goal here instead should be to make allocation decisions on the basis of evenly applied practices as fairly as possible across the spectrum of patients without turning to these biased quality of life assessments. So I want to discuss how can we attempt to do that, to meet that worthy, lofty goal. Allocation decisions ought to be based on clinical data, real clinical data, and this would include things like likelihood of survival, organ function, comorbidities, and other clinically relevant medical data or test results for a particular patient. And there are tools out there, medical scoring tools, that will measure somebody's acute physiology. One example is the Sequential Organ Failure Assessment, or SOFA score. There's another one called the Apache 2 scoring system. These could be used to help objectively evaluate a patient's status and to help make some comparisons among different patients in terms of which ones are worse off, which ones have a better chance of improving. So, if two patients arrive to the emergency room needing a vent and only one device is available, it can be offered to the patient with the lower priority score because the lower score means a higher chance of benefit. This makes sense. You know, they both arrive to the ER at the same time and you say, well, look, this person's going to benefit clearly based on these scores more than the other one. The other one may not make it, so we're going to preferentially offer it up front to that patient with the lower score. 
If two patients have the same score when they arrive at the emergency room, a ventilator can be allocated to one patient rather than the other, perhaps on a first-come, first-served basis, or by a lottery or by some other randomized approach. In other words, we're recognizing that both of these individuals would be entitled to it based on need, and we have to then use a random uh, approach or the you know, established policy of whoever arrived first. But if they truly arrived at the same time, then you would want something randomized. Anyone who is not ventilator eligible, how do we handle them? Well, these individuals should clearly be informed that a ventilator is not available, and they should be given the best available alternatives out there. They also should potentially be offered a palliative care consult if it appears that their situation is going to go critical soon, and they should receive spiritual and sacramental care as appropriate. In general, it will be immoral to take away or reallocate a patient's medically indicated ventilator without his or her consent to give it to another patient with a better prognosis who may die without it. In other words, if you start treatment for somebody and you give them a ventilator, that constitutes a commitment and a prima facie claim to continue to care for them. Starting treatment initiates that caring relationship. Otherwise, patients begin to distrust medical professionals. That arises when they realize those medical professionals are becoming dual agents. And for the clinicians themselves, this can cause moral distress as well, that they realize they're, you know, sort of having to mediate uh, by forcefully withdrawing the ventilator uh, from somebody and, and making it available to someone else. If a patient on a ventilator, though, is clearly deteriorating, going downhill quickly, and COVID-19 and its complications can be expected to cause the patient's death in short order, even if the ventilator is continued, well, in that case, dialogue should be initiated with the patient or his or her designated health care agent to get consent to remove the ventilator. And if you can get that consent, then that ventilator could be transferred to somebody who it might help more. Getting that free and informed consent helps resolve nearly every problematic angle of the ventilator rationing process. Scoring tools can be used to help decide which patient's health care agent should be approached first. In other words, those patients that are doing the worst, uh, they would be the ones you would typically approach their health care proxy, their agent, to ask, you know, will you give us permission to detach the ventilator? In other words, the realization that that ventilator has become heroic, it has become extraordinary, there is not a moral obligation to continue to use it, assuming you get that informed consent from the patient or from the patient's proxy. All right, so that, I think, gives us a nice framework to think about allocating ventilators in a situation of shortages. Let's shift gears and look at the question of developing vaccines. And I have a short video here that I'd like to run that I think provides a nice overview. The push to develop a coronavirus vaccine is moving at high speed. There are several different approaches for a potential vaccine against the coronavirus. The basic idea is that you would get a shot that contains faint versions of the virus. The vaccine would expose your body to a version of the virus that is too weak to cause infection, but just strong enough to stimulate an immune response. Within a few weeks, cells in your immune system would make markers called antibodies, which would be specific for only the coronavirus, or specifically its spike protein. Antibodies then attach to the virus and prevent it from attaching to your cells. Your immune system then responds to signals from the antibodies by consuming and destroying the clumps of viruses. If you then catch the real virus at a later stage, your body would recognize it and destroy it. In other words, your immune system is now primed. Collecting evidence on whether this will be possible, safe, and effective 
is part of what's taking researchers so long to develop a vaccine. It's a race against time to develop a vaccine amid a pandemic. Each step in vaccine development usually takes months, if not years. An Ebola vaccine broke records by being ready in five years. The hope here is to develop one for the new coronavirus in a record-breaking 12 to 18 months. So that provides a, a good description of some of the uh, steps that are involved and some of the considerations in generating a vaccine. And I think it's interesting to note that we have had an unparalleled development of vaccine candidates in the wake of this pandemic. Uh, last count, there were about 321 vaccine candidates under development with 33 or so in clinical trials, and several are actually quite advanced in those trials in phase three clinical trials. Those are the trials that involve uh, typically about 30,000 people receiving the vaccine for both safety and efficacy testing. Now, for a sense of perspective, no vaccine has ever been created in less than four years, with, I would say, 10 years representing a more typical timeline for development. So things have definitely been accelerated here in the effort to come up with something in the course of a year or two. So there is another concern that arises related to the production of vaccines. And this is related to the fact that sometimes cell lines derived from fetal cadavers after an abortion are used to make these vaccines. And those abortions may have happened decades ago. So I want to show you some of the problematic cell lines here quickly. There's one called WI-38. The abortion happened in 1964. It was from uh, the lung of a female fetus, and the abortion happened because the family felt they had too many kids already. Another cell line called MRC-5. The abortion was in 1970. Again, from the lung, came from a 14-week male fetus, and he was aborted for psychiatric reasons from a 27-year-old woman in the United Kingdom. Another cell line called PERC-6, the abortion happened in 1985, and it came from retinal tissue of the child after uh, an 18-week abortion. And finally, HEK-293, this cell line comes from human fetal kidneys. The abortion happened in 1972, Turns out these HEK293 cells have been used very, very widely in research and in pharmaceutical uh, development protocols. So these have become uh, very ingrained, if you will, in the research activity of many institutions, universities, pharmaceutical companies, individual investigators, etc. Now, it is possible and in fact, in most cases, when you make a vaccine, you do not have to use cell lines that come from an abortion. So what are some other sources that have been used? Well, here are a few. Uh, a cell line from the African green monkey, uh, from the kidney of these monkeys. Chick embryos can be used. Rabbit kidney. Quail embryo. Hamster cells. And many other sources have also proven useful in terms of manufacturing vaccines. Some vaccines, like the rabies vaccine, have two versions that are available, made by different companies, where you have one of the versions made from aborted fetal cell lines, so the example listed here is Imavax, made by Sanofi, and the other one made in an ethical way, not using cell lines from an abortion, in this case, Rabavert by Novartis, and this vaccine was produced in hen eggs. So it's good to know sometimes there are alternatives out there. You can ask your pediatrician, you can ask your doctor, and get further information about this. Some vaccines, however, do not have alternatives. Chickenpox is one example where 
the only vaccine that's available, was made using cell lines from abortions. So what about COVID-19? I want to mention the cell line usage in some of the, I would say, perhaps most likely to succeed vaccine candidates. Now, I say that only based on funding. That may not necessarily pan out, but Operation Warp Speed, which is run by HHS Health and Human Services, by BARDA, by the DOD, the Department of Defense, they have invested huge sums of money into promoting vaccine development. So there are three candidates that are being funded vigorously by this Operation Warp Speed that do not use fetal cell lines from direct abortions. One is Moderna, which is receiving about $430 million for its mRNA vaccine. The second is Merck, who is receiving about $38 million for its vaccine. And the third is Protein Sciences and Sanofi. In their collaboration, they're receiving $30 million for their candidate. None of these use aborted fetal cell lines. On the other hand, there are two others that do rely on fetal cell lines from abortions to manufacture their vaccines. The University of Oxford and AstraZeneca have a collaboration that is receiving $1.2 billion of taxpayer money uh, to promote its vaccine candidate, and this does rely on the cell line we mentioned earlier, HEK293. Also, Janssen Research and Development, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, is receiving about $450 million, almost half a billion dollars, for its vaccine and relies on a cell line from an abortion that happened back in '85, the one that we mentioned earlier, per C6. So this is an unfortunate situation that our taxpayer dollars are being funneled in a couple of instances to pharmaceutical entities that are using these problematic cell lines. This is something uh, that I wish was not the case. It's, it's regrettable that our money is being spent in this fashion. So the practical question that I want to spend a few moments on deals with the question of whether we can vaccinate our children with vaccines that are made from these fetal cell lines from abortions. Everybody feels uncomfortable about this. And it's like, do I have to, can I do this, or can I not do it, uh, can I object to this, etc. So this question about vaccinating our children with these vaccines, with problematic origins, was addressed by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith back in 2008 in an important document that was called Dignitas Personae. What did they say? They said, yes, you can vaccinate your child. They said danger to the health of children could permit parents to use a vaccine which was developed using cell lines of illicit origin, while keeping in mind that everyone has the duty to make known their disagreement and to ask that their health care system make other types of vaccines available. Uh, also, there was a statement that came out in 2005 from the Pontifical Academy for Life that addressed this and again said, yes, you can vaccinate your children, but the lawfulness of the use of these vaccines should not be misinterpreted as a declaration of the lawfulness of their production, marketing, and use. So this reminds us that there are differing responsibilities here. If you're an end user, that's one thing. If you're involved in manufacture, that's another. So within this general picture, again from Dignitas Personae, there exist differing degrees of responsibility. In organizations where cell lines of illicit origin are being utilized, the responsibility of those who make the decision to use them is not the same as that of those who have no voice in such a decision. Obviously that makes sense if we're a consumer and this is in a sense foisted upon us and we had no say about it, um, our, our moral culpability will be very, very different from those who made the choices along the way to manufacture max, uh, vaccines in that manner. A lot of times people will ask, well, 
if I receive a vaccine, am I cooperating in evil? Because the abortion occurred long ago, and generally for reasons not related to producing vaccines, it's not tenable to conclude that vaccine recipients today somehow cooperate in that original abortive event that may have happened 30 or 40 years ago. So it wouldn't be correct to say that there's cooperation in evil. The preparation, distribution, and marketing of vaccines from aborted fetal cell lines is generally morally unacceptable, of course, and the reason for that is that it could contribute to encouraging the use of material from other abortions, or could encourage abortions themselves for making future vaccines. So in that sense, there could be some kind of roundabout cooperation, uh, but it wouldn't tend to arise directly from a single end user as much as from those who are involved in manufacturing these vaccines by their decision to use the problematic cell lines. So what about alternatives? If alternatives are out there, do we have to use them? Well, certainly if doing so is practical, you should ask your physician to use an alternative vaccine. But there's not a moral obligation to use products that are less effective or inaccessible or that are dangerous or that cause serious side effects. So alternative vaccines against mumps or rabies prepared from chick embryos, for example, have caused serious allergies in some people. So that's a consideration. You have to use the one that was made with the problematic cell lines. Parents will wonder, well, you know, I'm kind of uncomfortable with the whole idea of there being any relation to an abortion that happened somewhere in the past. Can I just decline to vaccinate my child. So I want to share with you from the uh, Pontifical Academy for Life Statement a passage that I think helps clarify this. As regards the diseases against which there are no alternative vaccines which are available and ethically acceptable, it is right to abstain from using these vaccines if it can be done without causing children and indirectly the population as a whole to undergo significant risks to their health. However, if the latter ex are exposed to considerable dangers to their health, vaccines with moral problems pertaining to them may also be used on a temporary basis. So again, you can use alternatives if at hand, but not strictly required and declining to vaccinate. There's going to be some other prudential judgments here about risk to children, risk to others. So for example, when a woman is infected with rubella, which is the German measles virus, during a pregnancy, especially during the first trimester, the risk of fetal infection is high, about 95%. The virus replicates itself in the placenta and infects the fetus and can cause spontaneous abortions, neonatal deaths, deafness, blindness, or mental retardation. So there's some very significant concerns regarding the spread of the German measles virus. And we all have a duty here to prevent this from spreading, especially aware of being aware of the fact that pregnancies, women who are pregnant, uh, are at particular risk for serious, serious side effects. Now, it's interesting to note that vaccine vaccination rates are falling, and this is partly attributable to the overwhelming success of vaccination programs in the middle half of the last century. Today's parents have grown up in a society that never witnessed the devastating effects of the diseases that these vaccines prevent. They never saw a sibling, for example, live in an iron lung ravaged by polio. They never buried an infant who died of whooping cough. They never knew anyone who became infertile because of mumps. And, you know, this means that a lot of times People may think that they can decline to vaccinate themselves or their children uh, because they think the risks have gotten so low and they've sort of lost touch with the seriousness of some of these, these public health risks. This shows a child in an iron lung. And this is a picture of one of these clinics where there were a lot of these iron lungs and people were uh, kept in them, sometimes for very extended periods. This was, in particular, largely due to polio. Polio mainly affects 
kids under five years of age, it damages the muscles in their lungs so they can't breathe. And during these epidemics of polio, the iron lung ended up saving many thousands of lives. But of course, the machines were large, they were cumbersome, they were expensive. In fact, in the 1930s, an iron lung cost about 1500 bucks, which was the same price as uh, the average home in those days. The cost of running the machine was also prohibitive, especially when patients were encased in these metal chambers for months, for years, and sometimes for their entire lives. So to the question, can I decline to vaccinate, it's important to keep in mind the seriousness of these diseases. Pediatrician Gwyneth Spader has offered some helpful reflections on this. This was published in one of our publications, the National Catholic Bioethics Quarterly. She says, through participation in the normal vaccine schedule, a child is personally defended against disease and contributes to the general well-being of society by offering protection in the form of herd immunity. There are now only 21 states with childhood vac vaccination rates above 90%, the critical number for the creation of herd immunity which is the ability of the many to protect the few. There is a pervasive and problematic opinion, she continues, that individuals have little responsibility toward the common good of society. A parent can easily say to himself, I'm not going to vaccinate my child because he's not likely to contract these diseases, and I'm not responsible for the health of anyone else. There's a problem with that kind of view. She continues, parents must raise their children to be mindful of the weakest among us, including the very young, the immunocompromised, and others who cannot be vaccinated themselves. So this duty uh, to look out for the common good is something we need to pay attention to. Now, risk assessment around the development of these vaccines there's another level here that we need to recognize uh, that there is, uh, it's not always possible to be aware of all of the risks that may follow. So back in 2009, governments around the world were gripped by the fear that the swine flu would kill thousands. There was an outbreak. The European Medicines Agency decided to license a vaccine called Pandemrix. It was created by GlaxoSmithKline under exceptional circumstances. And they granted that company an indemnity for using the vaccine and ordered enough doses for the whole population. The vaccination started in October of 2009, even though by that point the UK government was aware that the pandemic was not likely to be as deadly as they had first thought. In the years since, Pandemrix has been linked by numerous studies to instances of narcolepsy. This is an incurable condition that leads to chronic fatigue and difficulty sleeping and has effects including night terrors, hallucinations, a range of mental health problems, and some sufferers can suddenly lose consciousness and collapse without warning. So this just reminds us that you don't want to go too fast into uh, making vaccines available, but at the same time there are going to be some potential long-term effect, uh, effects that you may not be able to foresee or analyze ahead of time. One more example that reminds us how testing is never perfect and the risk is never zero, uh, it's, it pertains to the influenza vaccine back in 1976. At that time more than 40 million people received a rushed flawed influenza vaccine that was linked to at least 500 cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, this is a, a kind of a problem with the nervous system. And there turned out to be no pandemic. And just as with the current warp speed development of a coronavirus vaccine, the 1976 vaccine was indeed rushed, as it needed to be. The never-before-seen side effect of Guillain-Barre syndrome had a low frequency, a frequency of only about one in a hundred thousand. Pre-approval safety, safety testing never runs 
to millions of volunteers. It tends to be more in the range of 30 to 50 or 70,000. Coronavirus vaccines, now being rushed, will each be tested in up to 30,000 people, including different dosage groups and a placebo control group. Complications at a rate of 1 to 100,000 are still not going to be recognized. So this means that there may be some things that will occur further down the line. I think perhaps of greater concern is that leading coronavirus vaccines are made with some new technologies, specifically with nucleic acid technologies based, for example, on RNA. And these have never been used in man before. So they're brand spanking new, unlike in 1976 with the swine flu vaccine for which the technology had been around for a while and had been long in use. So this means there's always some risk associated with the development of new vaccines. We can never bring that risk down to zero. What about universal vaccine mandates? Well, expected population health benefits from widespread vaccination do not automatically create a moral obligation for everybody to be vaccinated. Experimental or novel treatments with only a limited knowledge of their side effects and of their adverse events, their efficacy, their long-term consequences, as we discussed earlier, these are never morally obligatory for an individual. And as such, a new vaccine cannot be mandated by the state and any form of coercion requiring this of people uh, would be unethical. Instead, the state or the government or other entities must seek to convince people through careful and appropriate explanation of their personal need to receive a vaccine so that they may freely choose to do that on their own initiative. That's really the way that vaccines should be promulgated in the population, and that, that can work very effectively to achieve herd immunity. So I'll stop there. I want to make a quick mention of a program that I founded together with Dr. John Haas, our former president, a number of years ago. This is a one-year certification program in healthcare ethics. It's mostly online an opportunity to go deeper into these issues. If you find yourself saying, gee, I'd like to learn more about Catholic bioethics, how can I do this? What kinds of opportunities for education are out there? Check out this program. We have more than 1,000 graduates, and it really provides a sound foundation and basis uh, to understand the church's teachings and uh, how to reasonably approach some of these modern bioethical dilemmas. Also, you can go on and get a master's degree from two other institutions that we are paired with. So I want to thank you all for attending this presentation. It's been a great pleasure to be able to spend some time with you, and I look forward to our Q&A. Thank you very much, and God bless you.